Hi everyone, welcome to this newest video. Uh, it's a special one because uh, we are starting a series about the VCDX program. Uh, my name is Johan, I'm VCDX 238 specialized in DTM. Uh, and together with me is uh, one of uh, well, our um, hosts for these uh, Lightboard videos for the, the past couple of ones. It's Jeffrey Custers, please introduce yourself. Yes, yeah, so my name is Jeffrey. Uh, I'm a VCDX uh, 252. Uh, I recently achieved my double VCDX on NV. So uh, yeah, I'm really excited to, uh, to uh, well, talk you uh, guys through VCDX and what it takes and uh, what's included in the design and yeah, that sort of stuff, so yeah. Yeah, so our goal with these uh, videos is to get you people some uh, more information about the VCDX program, um, the requirements that you need to uh, take into account when uh, thinking about the program, uh, but also, what's, what's the value of uh, being a VCDX to the business? And what does it take to become a VCDX? Uh, so, Jeffrey, what would you like to highlight today? Yeah, so today, uh, well, we're, we're starting with the blueprint. You know, if you're going to do VCDX, then your first stop would be to take a look at the blueprint. Um, and there you will see that you will have to uh, well, kind of deliver three really important elements in your, in your design. That's a conceptual design, a logical design, and a physical design. Um, there is a white paper from, from Zekman uh, from in the 80s, and it's called Conceptual, Logical, Physical. It's simple. Well, believe me, um, it's, there's a lot of confusion about, you know, especially with, with you know, uh, VCDX, uh, SPREs that are, you know, coming more from an, from an administrative background, so yeah. in an ops role. Um, so I thought it would be a good idea to break down the conceptual design because that's the most kind of abstract of, of your entire design. And in my opinion or our opinion, uh, the conceptual design is the most important part of your design because in that conceptual design, you'll make uh, the most um, critical decisions for your business. For instance, what am I gonna do with availability? Um, if your conceptual design already describes uh, like the, your business um, uh, criteria, your business um, requirements, that has an impact on the rest of the designs as well. So it's, it's the most important one. It's, it's the foundation of your it's entire foundation. design. So, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so if you look at the conceptual design, you know, I, I always use the example of a, uh, of a house, you know. If um, the conceptual design is all about, you know, the, the, the outcome, you know, what, what are we going to build? What are we going to realize? It's what I like to call the owner's view. So if you're buying a house or if you're, you know, building a house yourself, and you're not interested at all in, you know, how the plumbing is being handled and that sort of stuff. True. You just want to know how you're going to enjoy, you know, what, what's the value of the house. So th that's kind of the, the, the owner's view. The logical view is kind of the, the architectural perspective, you know, how do uh, um, the schematics on um, window sizes and, and that sort of stuff. St still kind of, kind of relating to, uh, to the owner's view, but it's not as detailed as the physical view because the physical design that's what we call the engineer's perspective, you know. That's what we techies, you know, like most. Those are the, the, the schematics of, you know, the wiring, the, the plumbing, and all the, all the cool stuff that's, that's, you know, beneath the, uh, the surface. Um, so, with, with, you know, taking that into account, looking at the conceptual design, there, um, um, there are a couple of important elements. So, we have your requirements in your conceptual design. You have some assumptions. Risks. And constraints. So, um, yeah, maybe it's a good idea to, you know, to, to briefly highlight these, these elements. You know, these are your air cars. Uh, you know, if you're going to do VCDX, you're going to be <laughs> hit by your air cars uh, over and over doing your mock defenses. Um, so maybe just briefly cover them and maybe dive a bit into uh, requirements and how you're going yeah. to gather them and you know, a bit more of a deep dive. Um, then maybe in some next videos we can do the same for the assumptions, risks, and constraints. Absolutely. Yeah? And uh, the important part to know is that these uh, elements are part of the conceptual design. So it's not just about architecture drawings, uh, but it's, it's mostly about the drivers of your design. And these are the most important elements of those drivers. 
Yeah, yeah, and and you know I forgot to mention, but what's what's even on uh, above these these four uh, elements is you know the business outcomes, the business yeah. drivers. You know what's what's in it for the customer, what's in it for them, uh, what are you trying to realize that that will make you know uh, uh, capex improvements or uh, operational efficiency or whatever, yeah. anything that can help the business you know move forward. Next to that also is the scope of the project. So it's, it's good to talk about outcome. It's good to talk about these elements. But for instance, if one of the requirements is to scale out um, as, as uh, fast as possible or as good as possible, or to size it uh, for, let's say, a thousand users, those requirements and those elements, if, if wrongly scoped, could have a wrong outcome. If you're sizing for 2,000 users and you eventually end up with 3,000 uh, users and you didn't uh, specify that in the scope, the outcome of the project will be a wrong one. So it's really important to, to uh, define the scope as well. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, so if we, if we look at these four elements, uh, well, requirements, they kind of break down into two, uh, the two main categories. You have your functional requirements and you have your non-functional requirements. Um, yeah, so functional requirements, those are all about, you know, what the system should, should deliver. It's really about, um, and it's, it's not about how, that's, that's a non-functional part. So if you're stating that your design needs to include site recovery manager, for example, that's a bad requirement. That's not a functional requirement. No. The functional requirement is to create a resilient uh, system that is able to recover from a data center outage or whatever. That's a kind of a functional requirement. If you take the analogy of the house uh, into account again, yeah. it could mean that you uh, would like to accommodate four people in, in a house. Yeah, exactly. But you're not stating how you're uh, go, uh, going to accommodate that. So not in terms of the number of rooms or beds mm -hmm. or stuff like that. No, you just want to accommodate four people in that house. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so the functional is all about what? Yeah. The non-functional is all about how. That's, that's a really important uh, element. And you know, there's also a good way to, to categorize uh, your functional and non-functional uh, requirements. Um, the, VMware is using a term that's, that's, uh, that they call design qualities. And those are, um, uh, well, what I, what I like to call the, the illities. Yeah. <laughs> Availability, manageability. Uh, scalability, all those kind of kinds of you know fun non-functional requirements that allow you to categorize um, all your non-functionals, and it's um, it's really handy. You know, if you're doing a design workshop with a customer, then it's a really easy way to categorize. You know, just put all the design qualities on uh, on on the screen, and you know, let, let, let's just go over them. Availability. Manage ability uh, performance recoverability yeah recoverability yeah. and security yeah from a data center perspective yeah um, <coughs> these are uh, the mo the most commonly used. Uh, if you're looking at uh, VDI, for instance, so the DTM uh, uh, part, yeah. you'll be using uh, usability as well because it says something about the, uh, the performance for the end user or the, the way the end user consumes your, your services. Yeah, so there's even an ISO standard on, on quality management uh, that, that, you know, that has a whole list of other, well, uh, illities. And, uh, yeah, you can see the, follow this link and you'll see the uh, Wikipedia uh, page to, uh, to all of those uh, design qualities. Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, and what you said, you know, from a data center or a network and security perspective, these are kind of the, the main categories that yeah. you can use to, to categorize, um, well, you, your non-functionals. Um, yeah, so, um, Johan, just a question, you know, if you're, doing an inventory of functional requirements. Um, how do you go about, you know, you know what, what should be included, what must be included? Is it, how, do you, how do you attack that? Yeah, so uh, what's always a good thing is, uh, well, 
obviously you start talking to the business and uh, the business will give you those requirements. Stuff like um, the system should be available or should be uh, able to um, um, still run in case of a data center failure or still run in case of um, uh, any other type of failure or from a security perspective should be able to uh, still continue in case of uh, a data breach, something like that. Uh, but it's good to characterize or to um, uh, give a certain weight on those requirements and that's why we use the Moscow, uh, sy the Moscow system. So could you yeah, write sure. that down? Yeah, I'll just use a bit different color. I love so this it's handwriting. Called, yeah, it's, it's the Moscow uh, uh, So it's the must-haves, yeah. your should-haves, your could-haves, and your won't-haves. Yeah, so the must-have specifically dictates that this requirement must be, a, must be part of the design. So you won't be able to deviate from that um, uh, requirement. Yeah, so you always, in, in whatever the scenario, whatever the situation, if you classify a requirement as a must-have, then you need to meet that requirement always. Yeah. Yeah, a should have is um, kind of a guideline in, into, you know, it, it, w it would be great if this is pos uh, uh, part of the, uh, of the infrastructure, of the design, but it's not um, as... There, there is some, yeah, there is some uh, room for negotiation. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So if, you know, within reason, if you, if you can uh, meet this requirement, then it's not, you know, killing your design. You're yeah. not, not delivering on your on your design requirements. So, um, yeah, maybe just to uh, to clarify this, must, should, could, and I I always like to use the won't have here, uh, but I know uh, some of the other architects uh, also use uh, w would. would have. Yeah. Um, but I li like the won't have because you can really put something that's that's kind of a must have, but opposite, you know, really uh, hard in your design. So yeah. uh, I like to use it that way. Um, yeah, the could haves, those are really the nice to haves, you know, if it's possible within budget, within time to realize a could have, then you should go about it. But you shouldn't, well, uh, put your whole project at risk to meet a could have yeah. requirement. Um, and the bone devs is something that you absolutely won't tolerate or won't allow in your design. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I think this, this kind of captures the requirements. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should briefly cover the assumptions and the risks and the constraints just in a couple of sentences, and then we could dive into those in a, in a separate Lightboard recording. Absolutely. Yeah, so assumptions, that's, um, that's in my opinion, uh, the... Um, the area in which architects are making the most mistakes, if yeah. you ask me. Uh, assumptions are always like, uh, the assumption is that the customer will deliver a DNS server or DHCP. In my opinion, that's a scoping item. Yeah. Um, because you can, an assumption is an uncertainty in your, in your design. So um, if the customer is going to deliver a DNS server, that's something that you can validate. You know, that, that should be the goal of your entire design as, as an architect to, to minimize the number of assumptions because Absolutely. an assumption is uncertainty and uncertainty leads to risk and you want to minimize your risk. So um, just putting something as an, as an assumption, uh, it, just to put it out of scope, in my opinion, that's a wrong approach. The sh an assumption should really be something that at, at that moment, something that you're unsure of and you're going to put a lot of effort into validating as much uh, of the assumptions as you can uh, but there, in, in reality, there will always be kind of uh, a couple of assumptions that, yeah. that you can't really validate. Um, Could you like uh, give an example of, of one of the assumptions that you? Yeah, you so so a across? typical one is about is about growth. Uh, you know, every design you, you you talk to your customer about. You know, what's what's the anticipation on on, uh, on growth, um, and and that's always an assumption. You know, you can look back at at historical data, and the customer can say, well, we we're assuming that we're going to grow. 10, 20, 30 percent, um, but that's really something that you can validate because yeah. it's something that's in the future. So that, that's, a, that's a, I, think, I think, a perfect example of an assumption. Um, so the risk that, that comes with that assumption is yeah. obviously, so if, if growth is exceeded, 
it, it does mean something in terms of the, the already sized infrastructure. Yeah. So if you're going to size it for, uh, let's say, 10% growth and 20% growth um, uh, um, actually happens, that will probably mean that the infrastructure needs to be scaling, scaled out or scaled up um, um, in, a, in, a, in a different pace than, than uh, expected up front. Yeah, and I think that that kind of uh, leads to, to, the, to the third one, risks. In my opinion, every assumption that you put in your design should be also written out as a risk. Absolutely. You know, what happens, you know, what risk is, is introduced if we're, if we're making a false assumption? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's my golden rule. Every assumption is a risk. And, you know, there could be risks that, that kind of um, um, are linked together, you know. If you have a constraint, for example, that you have a limited capacity in your data center facility, uh, and you're making the, a false assumption about growth, um, well, there could be a situation in which you can't scale out your environment anymore because you don't have any, you know, cooling or power capacity yeah. or physical room. Um, so, so, you know, these three are really closely related. Um, so again, and, and a constraint can also turn into a risk because a constraint is something that really limits you as, a, as an architect. Yeah, so it, it's, it's, it's a must-have um, requirement, basically, but yeah. with a limited scope of uh, design capabilities. Yeah. So, for instance, if, if the customer dictates you that you need to um, use um, hardware from vendor A, um, and vendor A and that specific type of hardware um, uses, for instance, a network fabric that's already fixed, it does limit you in, in your uh, additional design decisions, such as, um, um, well, um, blade enclosures do have uh, or could have a... Um, um, uh, a limited uplink capacity. Or, yeah. 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 And and yeah. then you, you you'll be you won't be able to exceed uh, or, or to use uh, different type of fabrics uh, uh, next to the, the ones that you have to use. So that's that's a specific um, example of, of of a constraint. But it, it's it's a must um, uh, uh, a must have requirement with a limited scope of uh, of design um, uh, capabilities. Yeah, and I think there's a close relation between a, a must have non-functional requirement. Those are typically your constraints. Yeah. You know, if you can negotiate with your customer about it, if it's really fixed, it's a must-have, it's a non-functional, then chances are it's a, it's a constraint. Yeah. That, and that's something you have to deal with as an architect um, and within reason. You know, if you, if you throw all the money or all the resources at a constraint, you might be able to fix it. But if a customer, for example, has just spent, you know, uh, tons of money on, on a new spine leaf network um, and you come in as an architect with an SEDC, environment, you know, to design. Um, you can't realistically uh, expect the customer to, you know, scratch the whole uh, physical uh, network and, and, and build something new, you know, following your uh, requirements as an architect. So, yeah, so within reason, it should, it should be non-negotiable. Uh, yeah. Then, then you have a constraint. And from a personal perspective, constraints make a, a project fun because these are the, the bits of the, the, the puzzle that you need to uh, start with. Those are uh, the, the things that make uh, every project different. So yeah. constraints are there for a reason um, and you definitely need to take them into account. Yeah. Yeah, I think we, uh, we kind of covered, you know, all the important aspects of, uh, of a conceptual design. Obviously there's a lot more content, um, you know, that, that's, that's below the surface of, of you know, all these, uh, these term, the term, the, this terminology on the, on the light board. Um, yeah, but I think we, we kind of gave a good overview of what should be included in the conceptual design. Right. So now you have an overview of the different elements of uh, um, the conceptual design. In the next video, uh, we'll guide you in how to convert these elements into a conceptual architecture. Uh, cool. Jeffrey, yeah. thanks for um, explaining everything related to the, um, uh, the conceptual elements to us. Yeah, thank you. Um, for you, thanks for watching and see you next video.